How's it going everyone? Mickey T here. Welcome back to the channel and welcome to my list for the top 50 albums of 2020. It's no secret that 2020 as a whole has been a miserable year for everybody, myself included. I'm also sure that all of you watching have your own escapes from the misery that 2020 brought us, whether that be through mediums like movies, TV shows, video games and such. For me, my escape was music and 2020 was a year that brought us a lot of great music. So to acknowledge that, I've put together my list of 50 albums that I loved from this year. These are albums that struck a chord with me through one way or another throughout the year and come off as some of the most memorable and enjoyable to me. For this list, I'm just going to quickly skim through my 50 to 25 placements as I don't want to make this video two hours long. So enough waffling from me and you know, let's just get right into it. Starting off from 50 to 25. It may be no currents or lonerism, but the slow rush sure has its gratifying moments. It's a great psychedelic pop record from Kevin Parker, and with its concept of time, it makes it all the more of an interesting and underappreciated record in Tame Impala's discography. From King to a God is an incredibly solid, well-written, visceral, and well-produced piece of work from my favourite Griselda member, Conway the Machine easily one of the best produced and diverse records in the Griselda catalogue and one that feels like a defining moment for Conway as a lyricist and as an artist. This Does Not Exist from Lil Darky is an incredibly well done piece of edgy Soundcloud type rap that has some very interesting crossovers in its production. And plus for a project like this it sounds incredibly dense. It's somewhat overly edgy but if you like some interesting layered and textured production on a hip hop record that also goes hard then I'd recommend giving this a go. Gift at Sogetsu Hall is easily my favourite live album of the year. It features Ichiko Aoba doing her thing and making an album that's just outright gorgeous with its folk sound, instead in a live setting. This is easily my favourite thing Ichiko Aoba has done this year and like I mentioned, it's easily my favourite live album of the year. Goopy just brings non-stop back-to-back -back and dynamic bubblegum based bangers on None with some incredibly fun production. If you want something to go ham with then Goopy's got you covered with None. Soul Lady opened my eyes to a lot of K-pop music and for sure it's the best K-pop record of the year for me with its feel-good nature and city pop sound. I have too much fun with this record and props to you Kika for that. With its fast-paced breakbeats, great sampling and intoxicatingly gorgeous atmospheres, Sewer Slot really made themselves stand out with Draining Love Story. If you haven't heard it already, please check it out, it's one of the best drum and bass albums I've heard in a while. Emotionally devastating, intense and in your face, Spanish love songs really struck a chord with me on Brave Faces Everyone. From the songwriting to the vocals to the instrumentals, it's a well done emo and pop punk record that for sure deserves a mention and for sure deserves your attention. We Were Sent Here by History from Shabak and the Ancestor stands out to me as one of the best jazz records of the year easily, as everything on here just feels so vivid, intricate and engaging. What Shabaka Hutchings and everyone else involved on this record does is exciting, and they create a consistently great atmosphere that I couldn't get enough of this year. Peaceful as Hell sees black dresses take electro-industrial to the next level. It's only elevated further by its songwriting, rough mixes, performances, and small details. Want something noisy and harsh while also being a great listen? then Peaceful as Hell is for you. Rina Sawayama's debut record Sawayama is one of the most invigorating and lively pop records of the year that features some impressive and varied production, impressive songwriting, and outstanding vocals from Rina herself. So many moments on Sawayama are incredible to the next degree. Some of the best pop songs of the year are on this album, and you're missing out if you haven't heard it yet. Protein Threat is a thrilling psych rock album from the OCs, and it sees them blend their sound with garage punk, and it works for them in the best of ways, with plenty of wildness to keep you going, all while remaining incredibly fresh. Benny the Butcher's Burden of Proof feels like a preemptive victory laugh for the Griselda member. Not only because him and Griselda have a great few years in the game, but also because I think this is the best project in the Griselda catalog. Hit Boy's slick and triumphant production on this album melts incredibly well with Benny's performances, and Benny never disappoints on a verse. The best thing that Griselda had to offer this year, and I'm only excited for more music from Benny the Butcher. The short but sweet Dos Siki is another great project from the Japanese hip hop group Dos Monos, with its hectic and bombastic production alongside the group's great flows and chemistry. Dos Monos make the short lived tracklist on here one of the most unique and fun listens in an experimental hip hop record that I've heard all year. It 
It may not be as good as Dose City, but that doesn't make it any less important for the group. The way that HMLTD blend elements of post-punk with modern pop on their debut album West of Eden is truly something to behold, and it's really something special to me. With its incredibly diverse track list, interesting songwriting, and manic performances, West of Eden is one of the most exciting debut albums from a band this year, and I'm excited to see where they can go next. Although redundant in some places, Lament sees the screamo band Touche Amore working to their strengths once again, and as a result they make a record that continues to bleed emotion and power. In contrast with some of their previous work, Lament sees the band in a more hopeful place, and that makes this all the more important in their discography to me. 2020 was Nicholas Yar's year to say the least, especially when we consider the fact that he dropped three albums this year, one under Against All Logic and two under his own name. But Nicholas Yar's final release of the year, Telas, is my favourite project he's dropped this year. Being the most ambient of the three albums he dropped, Nicholas manages to make the four tracks present on here some of the most interesting ambient music of the year. The harsh glitchiness and ambience makes them all the more intriguing, and when you let the music soak you in, it's a whole other experience that I highly recommend. The Ascension sees Sufjan Stevens' production choice up for a synthetic feel, with smooth ambient electronic production that oftentimes feels very sparse in its soundscapes and jagged with its synths. I love this direction he's taken on here. The synth work on this album is very well crafted, very pretty in its presentation and downright gorgeous. Sufjan's soft vocals match the atmospheres he explores very well and while his songwriting isn't peak on here, it sure has its moments, especially on the title track. I feel like it's a very good effort from Sufjan that has its great highs and great qualities. It's for sure a notable album and a notable moment from Sufjan Stevens' discography. Denzel Curry and Kenny Beats bring out the best in each other on Unlocked. Denzel never really seems to let up the DMX energy and the quotable bars, but it's only amplified by the well-done boom-back production from Kenny Kenny Beats, which only makes Kenny stand out as a more prolific producer. These two bring out the best in each other and I'm excited to see them work together again. Manger on McNichols is a storyteller's album, as Boldy James is at his peak lyrically for this project with some of his most potent and devastating songwriting. Combined with the intricate jazz fusion production from Sterling Tolls, then we have an incredible combination on this album. A combination of some of the most well-crafted and dense hip-hop in 2020, and you sure as hell are missing out if you haven't heard it. Not to mention, Boldy James' project with The Alchemist, The Price of Tea in China is also a noteworthy record. As of late, Deftones have been becoming one of my favourite metal bands and with their new album Ohms, it only emphasises that Deftones still got it even 25 years after their debut. Ohms see them continue to combine the abrasive intensity and heaviness with atmosphere and bliss with some of their best material yet. Some of my favourite metal songs of the year are on this album and I'll definitely be listening to this for years to come and I can definitely see myself thinking that this could be more significant in Deftones' discography. With it being dreary and melancholic in tone, Fontaine's DC create an album that exemplifies the mood of 2020 with their sophomore album, A Hero's Death. Fontaine's DC are still the same forward-thinking, no-nonsense and often tongue-in-cheek band that we saw in Dog Growth, but on A Hero's Death it only proves that the Dubliners can expand what they do. While it's not the most groundbreaking post-punk album I've ever heard, it reels me in with its hypnotic structures, emotion, repetitiveness and fantastic instrumentation. Kiss My Super Bowl Ring by The Garden is such a varied and interesting punk release and ever since I first heard it I've been very fond of it. Wyatt and Fletcher shears take the core elements of punk like frustration and rawness and they experiment with all kinds of sounds that pull from numerous spectrums of music and it's quite impressive honestly. It only shows me that these guys are versatile at what they can do and there's a charm to the sheer abrasiveness and unpredictability of their music and I'm waiting in anticipation for what they could do next. Although I haven't listened to everything in the Flaming Lips discography, American Head definitely seems like an important moment for Wayne Coyne and Co. Their brand of psychedelia on here is consistently gratifying and gorgeous. It has so so many moments that left me in trance while listening to it, and the songwriting on this album of course has to be some of the best writing I've heard all year, some of which was just a real punch in the gut and interesting to look into. So definitely make sure to check out this Flaming Lips album if you haven't already. The Night Chancers in summary is just a slick album from Baxter Jury. There's just too much to love about this project from the slick grooves and bass lines to the synth work, the incredible production, the string work, and Baxter Jury's smart and snarky lyrics. It's short enough to keep you satisfied and great enough to keep be coming back, and I certainly kept coming back to this one, so great job Baxter Jury. Kicking off the top 25, I'm gonna go ahead with 
Melee by Dogleg. The Michigan emo band Dogleg pulled through at one of the best emo releases of the year with their debut album Melee, an absolute force of an album that will give you a non-stop buzz for its 35 minutes of runtime. It's a simple little emo and post-hardcore album that doesn't want to overcomplicate what it tries to do, instead it just delivers on being a very upfront, energetic, raw and passionate project. And fuck me, you can truly hear the passion from the band on this album, let me tell you that. And if you can't, what the hell are you doing? Sure, it may lack in some dynamic but so many tracks are just too good to ignore. Consistently good, might I add. Emotional potency, exhilarating guitar riffs, and passion is all that's really necessary for this album to work, and Dogleg surely make this work on Melee. At 24, I have chosen Dan Deacon's Mystic Familiar. I'm not very familiar with a lot of Dan Deacon's music, but Mystic Familiar was my first exposure to Dan Deacon's world, and since I first heard that album, it was a world that I never wanted to leave. Dan Deacon's brand of indie electronica, neo-psychedelia, and post-minimalism culminates incredibly well alongside his fun vocals on Mystic Familiar. He creates a very warm and busy atmosphere and soundscapes throughout the album that are just on a whole other level of entrancing. Not to mention, I feel like the charm of this record comes down to its carefree nature. It's like I'm being transported to a world where everything is just bright and colourful. A place where no troubles exist, a place where I could just zone out and forget while being accompanied by a chaotic synth orchestra, with Dan Deacon being the conductor of said orchestra. The tracklist itself has plenty of exhilarating yet memorable moments in its production, in its vocals, in some of its songwriting, in its passages. It's just got so many tracks that are amazing, like the grand become a mountain, the fun sat by a tree, and the insane ARP sequence. In summary, what Dan Deacon does on here is truly special. It's it's one of the best Indietronica and neo-psychedelic albums of the year, and it's an album that'll be getting more spins from me for sure. Coming in at the number 23 spot, I have chosen How I'm Feeling Now by Charlie XCX. With everybody under lockdown this year, we had to find something to do during this time. Well, when it came to Charlie XCX, she was finding the time to put together a new album about half a year after her most acclaimed album, Charlie. On that album, she showed us that she was capable of pushing the boundaries of mainstream pop, and on How I'm Feeling Now, it isn't any different for her. With production from people in PC music like AG Cook and Dylan Brady, and two months of producing, recording and writing, Charlie really made something special and honestly, it's my favourite album from her. Charlie and her producers really made a lot with so little. The album as a whole has this homemade and raw feel. That's truly apparent with some of Charlie's lyrics, which are definitely centred around her mental health during the pandemic, which we can all relate to, and the very out there, abrasive and experimental brand of production. The abrasive nature of the production is astounding, and it really lures me into the experience. It's bassy, bouncy, and dreamlike, especially with some of the ambient soundscapes, which are an aspect that I love about those tracks in particular. I was caught off guard by how out there it was, and given the names behind the production credits, I shouldn't have been surprised, honestly. The album feels varied in a way too, even if a lot of the tracks have the same aspects. There's a healthy mix between retrospective and cam tracks with fun bangers. Every instrumental on this album stood out to me in one way or another, and I just couldn't get enough of them. Charlie's performances add a lot to these tracks. They add a sense of potency and humanity to the very synth-heavy and raw production, and to be honest, I don't think I'll be able to get enough of it. How I'm Feeling Now is truly a massive moment for Charlie XCX, and a moment that I don't think I and many others will forget. At 22, I have picked Ultra Mono by Idols. The third album from Idols was an album that I've been heavily anticipating since its announcement, given that I adore their 2018 album Joy is an Act of Resistance. It was probably the most hyped I'd been for an album's release in 2020, and when it came out, you can bet your arse I wasn't disappointed. Now, the politically charged and progressive lyrics are a controversial talking point about Ultramano, as a lot of the lyrics here are basically sloganeering and don't really get to the root of the problems they discuss, like racism, war, sexual harassment, sexism, and much more. I've noticed this on more listens, but I personally just love the album more for its punk intensity. The performances and production, if anything else, really. The messaging is simplistic, yes, but I feel like it's compensated for with what Ultramano does sonically alone. I totally get it if it doesn't work for you. On Ultramano, idols basically turn up the loudness by 10 and do what they do best and beat the living shit out of me for 40 minutes. The opening track, War, is the best example of being beaten with sound, and I loved every second of that track. While it may seem like business is 
usual for Joe Talbot and the lads, they still remain fresh for me with their energy and aggression. The production feels a lot more clean on Ultramono, but not to the point where it's sterile, but where you can actually feel every punch and soak in every little bit of distortion. Plus, it has some of the catchiest songs on the year, like Mr. Motivator, Model Village, War, Rains, Killed Him With Kindness, Grounds, and many more. The only time where we ever really get a breather from the intense aggression is on the song A Hymn, then the rest just overwhelms you with intensity and back to back just loudness and bangers. Joe Talbot and co just go ape on this album and I enjoyed it thoroughly with every listen that I have and I'm still probably going to be enjoying it for a while. I don't think it's their best album, but I think it's great nonetheless. At 21, I have chosen King Cruel's Man Alive. If you told me about six to seven months ago that a King Cruel album would end up on my top 50 of the year, then I would have just laughed right in your face and told you that King Cruel is boring. But over the past few months, King Cruel's music has become essential for me, and I understand why that happened now. And Man Alive is the album that exemplifies why I love Archie Marshall's music now. Man Alive is just pure melancholy. The way the way the album makes me feel comfort in the dreary, depressive and melancholic atmospheres is still astonishing to me honestly. Archie definitely did it better on the ooze but on Man Alive it's just as intoxicating the way that Archie blends elements of post-punk, art rock and jazz and electronics is something special. The soundscapes that Archie creates on here are dreary yet intoxicating, the way it accompanies Archie is fantastic as his performances can range from subdued to yelpy alongside his sad lyrics, sometimes it gets very manic especially on some tracks in the first half of the album. It all just makes the vibe all the more fantastic for this record. Every subtle layer and nuance to this record are just fascinating and when you realise that you miss them and go back and find them, it just blows my mind every time, every time I discover a new nuance. It just amazes me, just every intricate detail on Man Alive is incredible. Not to mention, the track run from Perfecto Miserable to Please Complete Thee is just a perfect stretch for me. It's just amazing, no other way to put it. I don't really have much else to say other than this record was a comforting listen during the later stages of 2020 and I'm so happy that I gave it a chance again as this is easily one of the most intricate and interesting albums of 2020 by one of my favourite artists now in King Crew. Kicking off the top 20 we have Punisher by Phoebe Bridgers. Phoebe Bridgers sophomore album Punisher was the first album that I heard from her and ever since I listened to it it's been one of my favourite indie folk and singer-songwriter records of the year. Punisher for me has to be one of the most emotionally potent records of the year, and there's no way that you can deny that. All of these tracks are written and performed with pure emotion, and they're only made better with the production. That is just very gorgeous. It matches the tone of Phoebe's performances. It's serene, busy, and beautiful, yet hollow. Instrumentally, it's mostly comprised of these washed out sounds, guitars, and orchestral strings with scarce occurrence of drums, and Phoebe as a performer fits them beautifully. Throughout this album, they're just very emotive and powerful. Her vocals add to the quality of the emotional and personal songwriting. She goes over an array of her personal experiences and feelings on the people she's close to, as well as painting a portrait of a vulnerable being, and I just love hearing what she has to say. It features some of the best writing from any singer-songwriter record I've heard all year, it's quite an intimate release from Phoebe Bridgers, and all in all, it's a great album. For my number 19 spot, I have chosen Ultimate Success Today by Proto Martyr. Proto Martyr take home the crown for the best post-punk album of 2020 with their fifth LP, Ultimate Success Today, a post-punk record that has some great textures in its production, interesting songwriting, and fantastic performances from everyone involved. If you're familiar with the band's music, then you won't be surprised by much that appears on Ultimate Success Today, but that doesn't take away from the fact that this is a very great record. The collection of tracks that Proto Martyr crop up on here, to put simply, are great, they're a brilliant set of darkly textured and atmospheric post-punk tracks. They also take some noise rock influence which gives this record a more of a standout sound for me. The guitar work is impressive, the drumming is great, and Joe Casey vocally is charismatic as hell. He makes these songs all the more brooding with his presence. There's this ominous aura that this record presents as well that I find interesting, yet it maintains a steady pace with intricate and at times complicated instrumentation. It varies itself up without being stale, which I can always appreciate, and it has some incredibly memorable moments with tracks like Process for the Boys, Michigan Hammers, Tranquilizer, June 21, and more. So with that, Ultimate Success Today is a great statement from Proto Martyr, and of course it cannot go understated 
stage is how well crafted and great this album is for me personally. At 18, we have Leanne Le Havis with her self-titled album. Leanne Le Havis' self-titled album has been a shining moment in 2020 for me since I first heard it, and it's all because it's just a simple, yet beautiful Neo Soul record. Self-titled is filled to the brim with some of the most heartwarming, passionate, personal ballads that are produced well and sound fantastic. Its minimalistic and relaxing style of instrumentation is a perfect backdrop for Leanne to perform, and her performances are fantastic to say the least. Her vocal performances are the shining part of this album, as her performances and vocals are just pristine, and there's such a great emotional depth to how they sound. She also brings a healthy balance between some of the largest performances I've heard all year with tracks like Bittersweet and some of the most relaxing cuts I've heard all year like Read My Mind, Seven Times and Sour Flower. Not to mention her rendition of Radiohead's Weird Fishes is insanely good. It's easily the best cover I've heard all year, simply put. Leanne Le Havis creates an incredibly tight, personal, vocally stellar, and soulful album and I am begging you to give it a go if you haven't heard it already. At 17 I have Freddie Gibbs and the Alchemist with Alfredo. The way that I see it, a great producer will always be able to bring out the best in Freddie Gibbs. That's most apparent with his two collaborative albums with Madlib, Pinata, and Bandana. And on Alfredo, The Alchemist does just that, as it seems like Freddie Gibbs is just staying on his A-game throughout Alfredo's runtime. Freddie Gibbs' lyricism only keeps getting better and better with each project, and I feel like on Alfredo it features some of his best writing and bars, with plenty of moments that are just smooth as fuck, especially when Freddie is consistently dropping slick one-liners and double entendres. Not to mention, his flows are just fantastic on Alfredo. Freddie's performances are only amplified for by The Alchemist's amazing production. Every sample, every style he goes for, and every transition is just smooth as fuck. And it really stands out to me as some of the best production that The Alchemist has made, period. I also love all the features on here. Conway, Benny, Rick Ross, Tyler the Creator, all bringing fantastic performances to the songs. Some of my favourite hip-hop songs in the year are on this album, like Scott E. Beam, Something to Rap About, Babies and Fools, 1975, Look At Me. Basically this whole album, it's fantastic. I love it to pieces. I think it's easily some of the best work in both Freddie Gibbs and The Alchemist's catalogues, and it lands here as one of my favourite albums of the year because of that. For my number 16 spot, I give it to The New Abnormal by The Strokes. The Strokes' sixth album, The New Abnormal, is an album that has been on repeat for me for the past few months, ever since its release actually, and that's all because The Strokes managed to recapture what made their debut, Is This It So Good, while not trying to rehash old ideas. Instead, they try some different ideas while sounding as youthful, passionate, and exuberant as they did on their debut. Now, I haven't heard everything from The Strokes' discography, but I can already tell that The New Abnormal will forever be held as an important moment in their discography, as it features some of their best songs, some of their most interesting, gratifying, and amazing in their discography. Rick Rubin's production on this album works in The Strokes' favour by incorporating odd sounds and ideas to The Strokes' form Formula. The synths on here sound so great alongside the excellent and smart instrumentation. The experience is only made 10 times better with some amazing performances from frontman Julian Casablancas. So many moments on this album have just stuck with me since its release, like the adults are talking, selfless, at the door, eternal summer, and ode to the Mets. It's a fantastic effort from the strokes, and it only further shows that it's never too late to pump out quality music. At 15, I have After Hours by The Weeknd. The Weeknd really makes one of the best synth pop records of the year on possibly his biggest album yet, After Hours. On here, The Weeknd blends elements of synth pop, R&B, trap, and more styles to create one of his most ambitious albums to date, and it pays off as this is still one of the best albums from a massive mainstream artists this year and one of the best albums in the weekend's discography. One of the best hit songs of the year comes from this album, notably Blinding Lights obviously, but the rest of the tracks on here sound amazing, from the production to the vocals. Abel never really disappoints as a vocalist and of course he shines on that front, no questions asked. Some of his production is easily some of the best in his discography. I loved how varied it was and its sounds and how he explored them and I love how fantastic the synths sound. They remind me of Blade Runner in a way. And the whole subtle concept of the album is well written with each track consecutively telling a piece of this story and it just basically overarchs throughout the whole album. It's a nice subtle nuance to it. Every track on this album is constructed with pure brilliance. They sound fantastic and Abel really puts on a show for everyone to behold. It's a fantastic record from The Weeknd and one of the best in his discography in my opinion. At 14 we have Circles by Mac Miller. 
Mac Miller's posthumous album Circles is an album that has stuck with me since its release, and I feel like it was important that we all got to hear it. Sonically, Circles sees Mac Miller straying the furthest away from hip hop than he already has. He already expanded his musical horizons on some of his previous work, but not to the extent that it was on Circles, as Mac was singing his way through most of this album with rare moments of him rapping. The songwriting and production is amazing on this album. Mac Miller and John Bryan worked on this album up until Mac's death, and since then, John Bryan Ryan has been working on finishing it, and he done a stellar job with the production on here. It's a companion album to Swimming, so it has some similar sonic qualities to it, except Circles has a little bit more of a sort of folk, not really type sound, but also varies with plenty of synth heavy tracks like Complicated and sample heavy stuff like Blue World. But what hit me the most about the album is the lyrics, as they're both beautiful and disheartening to listen to. He goes over a wide variety of sad topics like his struggles with addiction, depression, relationships, and the message that I got from this album is that Mac knew he was gonna die, he knew what was gonna happen, and it seemed like he was fine with it. There was a whole lot more for him waiting on the other side, you know? First time I ever heard this album, I couldn't fathom how much I felt like I needed to hear this. Circles in Summary is an album that really is a genuine thing that Mac Miller would have put out if he was alive. It's no greedy attempt of grave robbing from the label, but rather a send off that we needed to hear from a talented musician who was unfortunately taken from us too soon. With that being said, Circles was an important moment in 2020 for me, and I'm sure it was very important for plenty of Mac Miller fans. And with that being said, Rest in peace to Mac Miller. For my number 13 spot, I have Whole New Mess by Angel Olsen. Angel Olsen's fifth LP, Whole New Mess, was an interesting endeavor from the singer-songwriter, as Whole New Mess sees Olsen recreate most of the tracks from her brilliant 2019 album All Mirrors, in a very stripped back, raw, and folk presentation. The recordings for this album are very raw, so I can get why people would be taken away from the experience, but for me, I think that this is one of Angel Olsen's best undertakings yet, and I truly think this album is quite underappreciated. At first I was apprehensive about whether I'd enjoy this record or not given the approach, but it feels like its own thing to me. It's like what Amnesiac is to Kid A in a sense, and I love the shit out of it. The raw recording feels a lot more intimate and a lot more serene to me. This sound does a lot more for Angel Olsen's heavily reverberated yet amazing vocals and her heartfelt songwriting, as the simplicity of it all makes her the focus. The instrumentals on this album are simplistic and raw, yet connect with me. The soundscapes are immaculate, and some of the reworks on here are even a little bit better than their studio versions. The DIY aesthetic has been a bit of a trend in 2020 for obvious reasons, especially with releases from artists like Fiona Apple, but Angel Olsen's attempt is easily up there as one of my favourites in this aesthetic. Every time I put this album on, I just have nothing but pleasant experiences with it. Every time I went for a walk and put this on, it was like I was in my own world, and I appreciate this record for that. An underappreciated moment for Angel Olsen in my opinion, and one I rate highly in Angel Olsen's discography. For my number 12 spot, I have chosen Moses Sumney's Grey. Moses Sumney's Grey would have probably ended up higher on my list because I think it's an amazing album in terms of lyrics, vocals, and instrumentals, but it's an album I rarely return to, hence why it's a little bit lower on my list. Moses Sumney really created something quite intriguing and ambitious with his double album. Every track on here is entrancing in its beauty, and that beauty can come from numerous different aspects, such as the vocals, the production, and the metaphorical themes of the record. Vocally, Moses Sumney sounds incredible. There wasn't a single moment on Grey where Moses disappointed me as his range is just insane and at times he sounds absolutely heavenly. That only makes the equally heavenly instrumentals all the more better as the production on this album is truly impressive. The sound of this album takes influence from all sorts of musical spectrums like art pop, neo soul, ambient and jazz. These styles complement each other so well in its setting and it sounds so vibrant and lush. For me it never really gets stale as every track on this album just sounds as grand and as fresh as I would love them to be. Lyrically Moses tackles themes like isolation, masculinity and sexuality in a smartly written and brilliant way and that adds to the whole experience for me personally and I feel like every minute of this album is necessary. It is a piece of art and I take it as a piece of art and it deserves every bit of attention that it wants. It deserves your attention for every step of the way. This is an artistic experience that is truly a defining moment for Moses Sumney in my opinion and I'm excited to see where he can go with his sound. But for now, Grey is Moses Sumney's magnum opus. 
For my number 11 pick, I have Zeros by Declan McKenna. Before Zeros came out, I've always thought of Declan McKenna as being a pretty decent indie pop artist that had some songs that I liked, but not much else besides that. But when his sophomore album came out, my expectations were blown out of the water, as Declan really outdid himself on Zeros. Zeros sees Declan McKenna do what many people in 2020 did, and take inspiration from sounds and styles of old. Declan brings back the sounds of space rock and glam rock, channels his inner Bowie and Elton John, blends these styles with indie pop, and makes one hell of a record. Pretty much everything on this album does little to disappoint and only keeps me satisfied with consistently great tracks that have some brilliant production and passionate performance performances from Declan. It's easily his most concise set of tracks to date, and it's easily got some of his best, most charismatic performances. You can tell that he wanted to make something with care, thought and passion, and the end result is an excellent album like Zero's. It's all so grand, majestic and lively, and all I can say when I first heard it was, wow, this is amazing, and with more and more listens, I still love it. I absolutely adored what Declan had to offer on this album, and you'll bet I'll still be listening to it for a very long time. Kicking off the top 10, we have What's Your Pleasure by Jesse Ware. I find it funny that in a year where we are all cooped up inside our houses, many albums inspired by the sounds of dance pop and disco would become so popular and get consistently replicated. Whether that be from the likes of Dua Lipa, Roisin Murphy, and most recently Kylie Minogue. But one album in this style has stood out to me the most, and that was What's Your Pleasure by Jesse Ware. It's an incredible disco and dance pop throwback from Jesse, and it's all packaged in a very intricate and detailed sound. A lot of care and passion was put into this project, and that shows with the rich sound, amazing grooves, and clubby atmospheres. Jesse Ware herself brings some incredibly charismatic and sensual performances, all of which are memorable and add to the slick nature of this album. Her normal sounds of R&B, pop, and other sounds blend pretty well with the change of sound for her on this album, and I'm furious as this should be getting more play in the clubs, but 2020 had to happen. This album has no right to have this many fantastic tracks. It's not fair, as every single track just keeps getting better and better, and with more and more listens, this album gets way better for me. Like, at first, What's Your Pleasure was just good, but after that I kept getting more entranced into the experience, and I loved it ever since. It features some of the best disco and dance pop songs of the year, and it's an album that I get lost in. The power of disco has not failed us in 2020 for sure, and What's Your Pleasure was the peak of that in my opinion. At the number 9 spot I have Miles by Blue in Exile. Jazz rap has been a long-standing staple in hip-hop. Its roots stem obviously from jazz and it's clear that there is an appreciation for that genre, and an album like Miles is just pure appreciation for the roots of jazz rap. Blue and Exile are no strangers to the underground rap scene, as their 2007 album Below the Heavens is a cult classic, but Miles has to be the closest that Blue and Exile have gotten to topping that album. Even with this album being a double disc project and sitting at huge 95 minutes in runtime, it manages to remain consistently engaging, interesting, and fresh. It's hard to even talk about this album, as there's so much depth and many layers to its 19 minutes that it's not really possible to cover everything. But what I can cover is pretty simple. Blue and Exile have always had great chemistry with each other as rapper and producer. Blue's rapping on this album is fantastic. His pen game is ridiculously good throughout the entire album. His lyrics cover African culture, figures within the culture, Blue's own struggles, and all while having some killer flows and impressively creative wordplay and rhyme schemes. Exile's production on this album is stellar. The incredibly jazzy instrumentals that Exile skillfully crafts seem perfectly molded for Blue. His straightforward rapping style works flawlessly with these intricate and sample-heavy instrumentals. It does ask a lot from the listener with its length, but at the end of the day, it's worth it. All for its impressive production and lyricism, which Blue and Exile certainly deliver on. At the number 8 spot, I have Alphaville by Imperial Triumphant. The New York avant-garde black metal band's fourth studio album is quite possibly the band's best album, and for me, it's certainly one of the most interesting and unique black metal albums I've heard all year. It certainly is one of the most interesting metal releases of the year. Alphaville sees Imperial Triumphant blend elements of black metal with very experimental and avant-garde parts of jazz, and this fusion works for the band in many ways, as they create an album filled to the brim with dissonant, extreme, powerful, chaotic, and intense tracks. The way that this album sounds is like the cover art. It's like a dissonant alternate dimension where the roaring 20s New York is just a hell of darkness, torment, and jazz. Alphaville used plenty of unique sounds and genre blends on this album that makes this one of the most unique albums I've heard in the black metal field. 
So many moments on this album build up intensity and tension with incredible payoffs and some off-kilter additions and incorporations. The soundscapes are hellish, the vocals are monstrous, the playing is fantastic, and it's well and truly one of the most harsh and interesting albums I've had to listen to with a unique genre fusion. So props to Imperial Triumphant for that. At 7, I have The Microphones in 2020 by The Microphones. Phil Elverum's revival of The Microphones moniker is certainly a special one in my opinion. The project has been dead since 2003, but Phil kept making excellent music with The Microphones since. But Phil Elverum wanted to bring back The Microphones for this, and he couldn't have brought it back in a more interesting fashion, as The Microphones in 2020 is basically one behemoth of a 45 minute song where we see Phil lyrically looking back on his life and the microphones. While it starts a little bit too slow for my liking, it picks up pretty easy when Phil starts singing, and I just let Phil take it away and soak me into the experience. The simplicity in his profound songwriting is a charm to Phil's music in general, and he doesn't let up on this album as his songwriting is just as great as it normally is on any other of Phil's projects. The only difference really is that it's going on for one 45 minute song rather than a collection of songs. Instrumentally, the microphones in 2020's avant-garde passages are constantly following this one path with motifs occurring through its duration and I can only really describe it as a meditative experience that you have to be ready to take in. It's kind of hard to even talk about it since there's so much depth in what Phil explores in the instrumental, as well as his lyrics, so to put it in the simplest of terms I can, The Microphones in 2020 is an interesting project from Phil Elvrum. It's a great way to bring back the Microphones moniker. It's got a brilliant video that accompanies the album well, so if you're gonna listen to the album, I feel like you should listen to it alongside that video, and it's for sure going to be a well-remembered moment in Phil Elverum's massive discography. At the number 6 spot, we have Song Machine Season 1 Strange Times by Gorillaz. Admittedly, for the past few years, my love for Gorillaz music began to dwindle unfortunately, when the band released albums like Humans and The Now Now, the former being my least favourite album from them easily. These albums just seemed directionless and mind-numbing to the point where it didn't even feel like a Gorillaz album, but more like a glorified Damon Albarn compilation album with features. For a while I had little hope that the band would be able to recapture the magic that made me fall in love with their music, until 2020 when singles were being released under the Song Machine name, all of which were surprisingly solid and honestly were some of the best Gorilla songs in a while like Desolate, Ares and Pac-Man. With the singles being on point and the features being impressive, I had expectations, very high expectations, and the result was truly impressive. Damon Albarn really made an album that stands up to the standards of Demon Days and Plastic Beach and I couldn't have been more ecstatic. This is what humans should have been. This contains the sounds and styles that made me love Gorillaz in the first place. The impressive creativity, the experimentation, and the character, all bundled into a really tight tracklist that never really loses its steam at all. Production-wise, this album is incredibly well done, it sounds immaculate majority of the time with art pop and synth pop production that feels very reminiscent of Plastic Beach in some respects, but not in a vein where it sounds like a direct copy, as there isn't much in the way of any trip hop on this thing. The soundscapes and the production on this album just sound gorgeous. They really outdid themselves with a lot of the engineering on this thing, and the sounds that the band try on here work with great results, even when we're talking about tracks like Ares, which explores New Wave, or the dance punk inspired Momentary Bliss. The rest goes for this kind of like neo-psychedelic experience that sounds so graceful in presentation and it just leaves me in awe. Gorilla's albums aren't without their features and the features were incredibly good on this album. They contributed something that suited the track very well, especially Peter Hook, Schoolboy Q, Slow Tie, Slaves, Fatumata Diawara, Robert Smith, and Beck in particular. The more I listened to this album, the more that I fell in love with certain tracks, and the more that I realised that Song Machine is the best Gorillaz album since Plastic Beach. So many tracks on this have been on repeat for me for months now, and I don't see myself stopping anytime sooner. Song Machine Season 1 was an amazing album in 2020, I'm so happy that Gorillaz are back making amazing music again, and all I can really say now is, come on, bring on Season 2, Damon, let's go. Kicking off the top 5, I chose I Let It In and It Took Everything by Loathe. The UK metalcore band's sophomore album is an album that I've been enjoying a lot more since I kept coming back to it, and with every listen I find myself loving it more and more. I Let It In and It Took Everything is an incredible body of work 
that I didn't expect to grow attached to with more listens. This album is filled to the brim with tracks that are unrelenting in its visceral metalcore roots but also comforting and dreamy with its shoegaze inspired atmospheres. There's clearly a Deftones influence there, but I feel like Loathe managed to stray far enough away from that comparison with their metalcore twist. The instrumentation on this album is immaculate. The harsher side of things get the blood pumping with meaty riffs that have a genty sound to them, pummeling drums and overall just being a real punch to the face. Alongside this, the melodies are absorbing me into a trance-like state where vocalist Kadeem France is just sounding incredible with the dreamy atmosphere. It's almost nostalgic to me in a weird way and I can't get enough of it. The track list flows incredibly well and it doesn't leave you with a single moment of dullness or boredom. It's just filled to the brim with incredible material that gives me an adrenaline rush and moments of catharsis. I love pretty much every track on this thing. I wouldn't say there was a track that I felt underwhelmed by. Even the interludes fit the album as well in my opinion. I just love this album and I'm very excited to see where Loathe can go next. At the number 4 spot I have Involved by Pace. De Vere. Involved is easily the best black metal album that I've heard in a while and it's for sure the best metal album of 2020. Paysage de Vere creates something truly special in this dark, hellish, and dissonant two hours of atmospheric black metal. Now this album is definitely asking a lot from the listener with its two hour runtime, and it's for sure not an easy sound to stick around with for two hours or a casual sound at that. But for me it's just on a whole other level of incredible. It's a mind altering experience that sees the limits of atmospheric black metal being pushed by one of the most interesting acts in metal right now. This album consistently hits you with tension building atmospheres and dark soundscapes that can only really be described as cold. It's like an audio equivalent of a nightmarish fever dream in a dark, snowy, and hellish forest. Basically the album cover. It's a haunting experience and I loved listening to every second of it. The dense, dark and ambient instrumentation throughout this thing deserves your attention for its entirety. It's possibly the only way that you can truly appreciate this album, and lengthier listens have always been some of the most rewarding for me personally. Whether that's with Selecta Ambient Works 2, a number of Swans albums, and of course Involved now. With that being said, Involved is a brilliant album that definitely deserves to be recognised as a moment in 2020. At the number 3 spot I have chosen RTJ4 by Run The Jewels. Run The Jewels have always been an interesting duo in hip hop for me. In fact, are easily one of my favourite hip hop duos of all time. RTJ ticked the boxes of what a great duo needs like incredible chemistry and distinct personalities, which Killer Mike and LP certainly have, a unique sound which they have thanks to LP's futuristic take on hardcore hip-hop, and the discography, which RTJ have in my eyes, and in my eyes, Run The Jewels 4 is their best work to date. If there is an album that could be used as a time capsule for how awful 2020 was, then RTJ 4 would be that album, as Killer Mike and LP's strong and progressive political lyricism hits the hardest on here, especially when you consider everything that happened over the summer in the US. And Killer Mike's verse on Walking in the Snow is a reminder that the brutality keeps happening, and when will it stop? LP's production is still outstanding as it normally is on a Run The Jewels project, but this time it has increased tenfold. It combines the futuristic and sci-fi nature of RTJ3, which on Run The Jewels 4 feels a lot more refined and a lot more concise, with the raw and punchy banger sound of RTJ2. Almost every track on here is varied with what it attempts to do sonically, and the collaborations from the likes of Josh Homme and DJ Premier are great. Killer Mike and LP are fantastic on the rapping end of things, the chemistry between the two is unmatched. The wordplay, the flows, the brutality, and the lyrics complement each other so well on each of these tracks, and they never fail to impress me. Not a moment of filler, it's all just killer. Every feature is utilised well, they're entertaining and they brought their own unique and brilliant flares to their respective tracks, and ever since I first heard this album, I'm just blown away by it. I never expected Run The Jewels to be able to top RTJ2, but in my personal opinion, they blew it out of the water with the incredible production, amazing performances, and great lyricism. Like I said, this album is everything I could want a Run The Jewels album to be, and I couldn't have asked for any better. RTJ4 is definitely one of my favourite albums of 2020, and in my opinion, it's the best Run The Jewels album. For my number two pick, I have chosen Fetch the Bolt Cutters by Fiona Apple. Fetch the Bolt Cutters was the first album that I ever heard from Fiona Apple, and since I first heard this album, it's been in the back of my mind and has never really left me, if I'm being honest. I've struggled to understand why it's never left me, and I'm still having a hard time even processing my thoughts on Fetch the Bolt Cutters. I guess the easiest place to start for me would be in the production. On Fetch the Bolt Cutters, the instrumentation is quite unorthodox. I had trouble wrapping my head around it in the first couple of listens, but I enjoyed this approach, and I appreciate it a lot more. Every piano 
piano note, every bit of percussion and every sound is done in this raw way, but at the same time it sounds very vibrant, passionate, colourful and emotive. Plus the way that it's mixed and recorded sounds like it was all done in one room. That's even indicated by the various recordings of Fiona's surroundings at her home on some of these tracks. Well this album wouldn't really be what it is without Fiona herself as she's delivering nothing but very raw, emotionally potent, personal and at times frustrating performances. You can hear this frustration in many performances throughout the album and she has every right to vent this frustration. She confronts her pain throughout this album head on, oftentimes quite bluntly, and it shows with every set of lyrics, some of which have stayed with me since I've heard the album. Fiona's vocals are great throughout the whole album and they only build on the instrumentation and captivating songwriting that she presents us with. And I'm certain that for years to come, Fetch the Bull Cutters will be held in high regard for music in 2020. It certainly has for me anyway, since it's at the number two spot. It pains me to not have it at the number one, but there was just one album I had to give it to, and that is Visions of Bodies Being Burned by clipping. Visions of Bodies Being Burned is the fourth album from the California experimental and industrial hip-hop group clipping, and it's also the sequel to the group's 2019 album, There Existed an Addiction to Blood, an album that was more of a focused concept album about creating a classic horror movie in audio format on top of the harsh clipping formula. I was excited for this new album, as I was optimistic that this sequel would top it, especially with the singles. Ironically, they sounded like they had more teeth to them than most of the tracks from its predecessor. Since Visions was released, I was just left in awe, as this album captures the horrorcore elements they attempted on their previous album so well with a lot more success, and it's one of those few moments that an album genuinely makes me feel uncomfortable, but in the best of ways. To start, I think that Visions of Bodies Being Burned is Clipping's best album. It feels like the album that truly defines them as a unique act in the experimental hip-hop field. It's filled to the brim with nothing but incredible sounding yet unnerving material that I just can't help but feel sucked into. This album is the audio equivalent of being trapped in an abandoned industrial complex in the pitch black of night while paranoia and fear is consuming you. If there existed an addiction to blood was the 70s vampire movie, Visions of Bodies Being Burned is the psychological horror equivalent of that. This album is clipping to the core. The harsh and experimental roots of the group remain as strong as they were on their previous efforts with production that's very similar in vain to its predecessor, but it stands out to me on here a lot more because of the detail and the atmospheres it creates. The intensity I feel when I listen to it and it truly never loses steam. The sheer menace of this thing keeps me coming back to it. David Diggs, to me, has always been one of the most underappreciated MCs of the past few years, and on here he just sounds incredible over this production. He always had a knack for standing out to me as a voice in hip-hop, but the man just never seemed to be phased by these instrumentals. He works so well over them with his hectic flows and his horrifying lyrics that have this subtle political undertones to them. His lyrics are even more horrifying on this album than they were on their existence an addiction to blood. He's depicting paranormal events, paranoia, the afterlife, serial killers, cannibalism, and those are just to name a few. He's truly the force behind the horror alongside the equally uneasy production. To say the least, clipping really blew my mind with visions of bodies being burned. I haven't heard an album that makes me feel the way that this album does, and with that being said, my album of the year for 2020 is Visions of Bodies Being Burned by Clipping. And there you have it. That was my top 50 best albums of 2020. Thank you so much for staying here. If you have, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this. And, and tell me, what are your favorite albums of the year? Leave them down below in the comments. Please be sure to check out the Taped Podcast. Be sure to check out my worst albums of the year list. Be sure to check out my mate Nostalgia's best albums of the year list. It's a pretty great list. You should give that one a watch. Watch the videos I've done with Trey Likes Bands. Check out my album of the year. And with that being said, my name's been Mickey T, thanks for watching, and let's hope 2021 is a good one.